everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And today, psychic medium John Edward tells his story. Now, me and John go way back, re really far back. Uh, back in the mid 90s, John was working in healthcare before he transitioned into a career as a full time psychic medium. I, at the time, was producing a morning radio show in New York City, and John was an instant hit. He parlayed his radio success into New York into worldwide fame, appearing on every television show from Oprah to Drew Barrymore to every radio show that's ever come out of speakers. Nowadays, John Edward is continuing his pursuit to inform people about the afterlife and how being a psychic medium works. So I wanted to get him on the podcast to find out how he became a psychic medium. Hey, John, how are you? I'm good, Joe. How you doing? I'm excellent, and I'm so excited that you took time from your super busy schedule to pop on this podcast and reminisce with me. And I want to start by talking about our very first meeting. And okay. I'm terrible at math, but it was probably 25 to 27 years ago when you walked into the doors of WPLJ Radio in New York City. And I was helping out a mutual friend of ours, Naomi DiClemente, on a Sunday show she was doing. And yep. At the time, John, as you know, I was like this kid who was a former intern working my way up. And they're like, you're going to help Naomi do this thing. And I'm like, OK, cool. So I would come in, get the studio ready and make sure everything worked. And then here you come and you're introduced as, I think, a nurse who's also a psychic. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 what do you remember from those early, early days before you essentially became a household name and you got to meet incredible people like me so long ago? Yes, indeed. Um, so the, we're going back to 1993. That's how far back we're going. So in, in 1993, my background is in healthcare. So I, um, I am a few credits short of a master's degree in healthcare and public administration. And while I was getting that degree in an accelerated program, I had always been doing the psychic work since I was 15. Um, I had left the clinical side of healthcare working as a phlebotomist, which is the person who draws your blood in the laboratory. And I moved into the administration side, which was the, at that time, the IT side of things. And I was working with a, a, an amazing lady. Her name was Pat, Patricia. And um, shout out to Pat. And Pat <clears throat> said, you have to turn on WPLJ radio right now. Naomi DiClemente is getting a reading by a psychic and it's not going well. And I was like, okay. And what had happened is Naomi had a reading with someone who gave her really negative information when she got engaged to Bob, her now husband. Um, and I was like, and Pat, you would like me to do what about this exactly? She goes, you need to call her and tell that's BS. And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to call up a radio station and talk to a DJ that I, that I don't know and tell her that the reading I didn't listen to was BS. And Pat said to me, well, you know, I was getting engaged. She goes, would you want somebody giving that type of bogus information to Sandra? And I went, no. She goes, would you want somebody affecting your potential relationship with Sandra like that? And I went, no. She goes, well, then you need to get on the phone. So she made me call the station. And the station, Anita, the receptionist, patched me through. And I wound up actually talking to Naomi. And I was like, this is going to sound crazy. I go, and you're probably the last person that's going to want to talk to me. I said, because you had a really bad experience with somebody in this field. I go, but can I just tell you that I think what you heard and from what I was told you heard, I go, it's not, it's not really true. And then I actually did like a mini reading for her. And I looked at their numerology. I looked at Bob's numerology. I looked at Naomi's numerology. And she says, oh my God, you gave me such peace of mind. Thank you so much. And that was it. I was done. I felt like I did my job. Simultaneously, um, I had been doing some different types of media here and there. And I was kind of like, you know, I, I was already known for doing the subject matter because I was doing this work since 1985. So it's almost a decade I had built up a, a, a following by name in like the tri-state area. Um, and then there was a PLJ signing, I think, at like a either a record store or something on Long Island. And my friend Ernie and I walked into the store and he goes, Naomi DiClemente from WPLJ Radio is here. <laughs> and I like remember looking at his tall. I looked up to him and I was like, why would you why, why would you say? Now, he had no idea I had talked to her. And I said, wow. I actually kind of like know her. And he goes, let's go say hi. And I'm like, I'm no. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> this woman's gonna think I'm now a stalker. Like I called right. a radio station and now I'm showing up at one of these like you know radio station places that you know. What, what do you what, what would you guys call it when you guys would do like a, an in store visit or something? Yeah, it was like a promotion. Uh, yeah, it was it, record signing that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think Jackie was the person, a salesperson that, at PLJ. Yeah, Jackie like walked over and it was another person that was there, and like like stopped me and then Naomi said, "Wait, are you John Edward?" And I went, "I am," and she and that's how we so I connected with Naomi. Now simultaneously, I was invited to do something at a restaurant in Manhattan called Serendipity. And they had me do a like group reading in serendipity. And that day, Todd Pettengill called me. So Naomi had said something to Todd. Todd read something about me doing what I was doing at serendipity. And he said, will you come on the show? And it was Todd who actually brought me onto the show. Wow. Yep. And then that was it. We became like, I was like your morning show psychic for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, it was. And, and let me, and let me go back a little bit to that transition from, the phlebotanist to yep. the full-time psychic medium because this is the 90s we're talking about so the idea of being a self-made anything you know content creator uh, uh influencer that was not a thing no so how did you realize or come to the realization that like this could be my living this is how i can this is how i could support a family raise raise kids what, what at what point in that journey did you realize that was going to happen so it's interesting. You who knows me the longest, right, are asking me some of the best questions that nobody <laughs> asks me like on, on this journey. So thank you. Um, my desire to do this professionally, like as my job was non-existent. I absolutely actually said out loud, this will never be my career because I was working towards a career in healthcare in the business side. And my goal was to run hospitals and run hospital systems. And that's what my degree was in. So to me, I was raised like, this is something that I can do because it's my passion, but it's not my job. Like you don't do this for a job. You don't do readings for a job. Like that's, let's be serious, be like responsible. So um, it got out that I was doing this and somebody that came into the hospital recognized me. Oh boy. And that person said, you work here? And I I nodded and I said, can you kind of keep this like quiet? Because I don't want people to know. It was a Catholic hospital. I was like, I don't want people here to know that I'm doing like readings. Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, no worries. No worries. Well, that didn't happen. Um, and I was due for a promotion, a title change, and a very substantial raise. And it was like kind of a promise. My, my main boss had gone out on maternity leave and I had covered the clinical side of the hospital. Um, and this other woman, Pat, took care of like the business side of the hospital in the information system technology, MIS is what it was called. So I started getting pulled into like VP meetings and the, you know, the vice president of, of the department was like calling me because I knew everybody from the clinical side because I worked in the lab. So I knew everybody literally all over the hospital by name because they, they knew me from when I was drawing blood. Anyway, my, um, my my big boss at the time asked me if I would come and sit into his office. He wanted to talk to me. So I called Sandra at work and I was like, it's happening. I'm getting the promotion, the title change, like here it comes. So Mr. Psychic was not Mr. Psychic that day. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. And I sat in this guy, Marty's office. Marty and I shared the same birthday. Really nice man. Um, and Marty said to me, so what's this talking to dead people thing, Joe? I literally like had that moment of like, like a car crash in my head because wow. it wasn't what I was expecting to have as a conversation. It was almost like it was like, you know, Clark Kent and Superman, two different like worlds. And, you know, here I was like waiting for my promotion at the newspaper. And I like looked at him and he goes, we're getting phone calls at the hospital where people want to know if you can do readings on your lunch break. Because people couldn't get in to see me. I was booked well in advance. So people were like, you know, well, can I, can I come to the hospital and get a reading? And I like, I remember like looking down at the floor and I said, I'm in the middle of doing something project wise. Can, can I come back at 530 and can we discuss it then? And he looked at me and he went, sure. So I went back to my office and I literally went, I don't care who you people need to get, but you get somebody in his family that's in the other side to show up at 5.30. So I walk back into his <laughs> office at 5.30 and I, 
And I said, Marty, I could, we could do one of two things. I said, I can either explain to you why you're getting the phone call or I can demonstrate. And he kind of like chortled a little bit and then went, please demonstrate. And so I did. And then about 25 minutes later, he said to me, you're going to have to leave. <laughs> and it was like a really big pregnant pause. And I didn't know what he meant. And I was like, it's like, leave my office and don't come back in tomorrow <laughs> or like leave right now because you need time to process. And he said, you kind of eradicated like 45 years of a belief system in less than a half hour. He goes, there's no possible way you could know any of the stuff that you knew. And I was like, well, that's why people are calling the hospital. And he goes, gotcha. So that night I left and I, it was a, it was a very different feeling because like it almost felt like the fabric of my world opened up a little bit. That's the best way I can explain it. Like, like a curtain opened up. And the next day, I got there like an hour early. And he always came in early. So it was just he and I in the office. And he, he always wore an Indiana Jones hat and a long trench coat. So he was like walking past my office. And I had a mirror that was like right on, on the side of my desk. So I didn't have to turn around. I could see people walking. So I kind of like looked in the mirror and he was standing there. And I turned around and he smiled and he goes, why are you here? And I go, like, why did I come into work today? Like, <laughs> I don't have a job. Why am I here? And he goes, no, but why are you here? Wow. And it carried such an, it was such an intense statement. And I went, because this is what I went to school for. And this is where <laughs> I'm supposed to be. And he went like this. He went, now he was one of the people who promised me the raise and the bonus and the promotion and the whole thing. So it was kind of a guarantee. Again, synchronicity. Sandra said to me, my wife, um, not, not at the, but she said to me at the time, um, we had just gotten married. Why are you, why are you killing yourself? Like doing like two jobs. You're like, you, you know, you're working two jobs. And I was like, well, one's my job and career. I go and one's my passion. I said, I have to do that. She goes, why don't you just do your readings? And I was like, absolutely not. And she wouldn't drop it. She kept pushing it. And I was wow. like, I was like, Sandra, I'll make a deal with you. I go, if I don't get the title change, the promotion, you know, the bonus, like all the stuff that was promised, I'll I'll take that as a sign from the universe. And I'll I'll do this the readings full time. She's like, Yeah. She's like, I don't know, like, you know, but I'm gonna be really completely transparent here. It was a I was a it was a guarantee. So it was the ending of an argument with my wife, not a universal like promise. Right. So then not too long after that, my boss came back from maternity leave and she and the other guy um, sat me down to talk about my increase. And what it was supposed to be was an 18% increase to bring my salary up to where the job should have been. Huge, right? Yeah. They told me I did such an amazing job that I was going to get a 3% increase and not the normal 2% that everybody... They, they, they kept talking, but all I heard was in my mind, holy shit, the universe is calling me out because I made that statement that if I didn't get what was promised, I would leave. And I just, I knew in that moment I was done there. Um, and I, I waited and I gave them 10 weeks notice. I made my last official day, Halloween of 1995. <laughs> Of course, um, I created because I'm extremely like OCD. I extremely I created a manual on how to do my job in that ten weeks because it was a uh, it was a computer job where all these like all these projects had had a beginning and a middle and they were ongoing and anybody coming into that position would have been like I have no history here. So I created the history of all the projects that I was responsible for for the person who was coming into my position. She sent me flowers. Um, and she said, I made her a superstar. And then, um, the, like really the top vice president of the hospital who I knew from the laboratory days made a special trip over to the building that I worked at and in front of everybody berated me and said, what is this crap? You're leaving this place to go read palms. Like, are you out of your mind? He was like, when you come crawling back here, if you leave this place, if you come crawling back here, he goes, I will personally make it my mission that you will not be hired. He was like, you know, you're on the fast track here. You're on the fast track. Why would you leave? And I smiled and I said, Sean, I am not leaving to read palms. 
He goes, oh, thank God. I go, I'm leaving to talk to dead people. <laughs> and he just turned bright red. He was really, he was really upset. He saw himself in me because um, he came through the ranks of the laboratory in the same way. Anyway, long story short, fast forward to Crossing Over. And I think it was the first season of Crossing Over. They announced me and I walked out and there was Sean right in the audience, front and center, clapping wow. away. And I just was like, wow, this is like karmic. It was kind of cool. So that was like, that was the journey. That's how wow. it happened. Now, uh, I've met your wife, Sandra, a bunch of times. She's a great lady. Uh, you, obviously, you outkicked her coverage, uh, and uh, she's way above your pay grade, as they say. <laughs> uh, but I wonder, how many women or partners would say to their significant other, be like, yeah, quit that steady job and be a psychic? I mean, uh, have you ever played that back in your brain of like how lucky you were to have her in your life? Always. When I tell you that there would be no John Edward without Sandra. There would have, it never would have happened. I, I personally wouldn't have done it. She was the one who pushed. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it because I wasn't raised that way. I was raised that you have to have a real job. You have to have, you have to have a degree. You have to have, you know, continuing education. You have to like, like all of that was how I was raised. And that was my mindset. So, you know, to, to do this, I, I can't even tell you, I, I don't think I would, I don't think I would have done it on my own. Like if there was only just me and I wasn't involved with anybody, I don't think I would have, I don't think I would have given myself permission. So yeah, it's definitely, I, I say this all the time without Sandra being that supportive. And I even said to her, after, you know, like right after I go, what if, what if I can't do this? And she's like, what do you think? You lost your job? You lost your powers? And I was like, no, no, I know I have my abilities. I go, but what if we can't, what if I can't pay our mortgage? Like that was a, she goes, well, if you can't pay your mortgage, she goes, then you'll get another job. She was like looking at me like, what is your, like, she was like, you, like, are you stupid? Like, that was literally how she approached it. Wow. But she's That's also awesome. the same person that while I was doing Crossing Over, there was a very powerful reading. And I remember we were in bed because it was like 11 o'clock at night that Crossing Over first aired on the Sci-Fi channel. And um, I remember sitting up in bed watching this one episode. And I looked at her and I was like, isn't it cool? Like, like, because I never really watched myself. So now I got a chance to watch this guy that looked and sounded like me doing, you know, doing reading. It was a really accurate, very profound uh, reading of, about a son that was coming through his, for his family. And I turned to Sandra, I was like, isn't it kind of crazy that I got that? And instead of going, yeah, that was amazing or good job. She was like, dude, they gave your ass a show. You best be getting fit <laughs> like that. Like that's who she is. You know, so oh. it was like, good job, like great job. You know, it was wow. like. That's who you are. That's what you do. Like, what you want to be? You want you want to party? <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's remarkable. And uh, you know, during that journey of you making the jump to a full time psychic, you were a big part of the Scott and Todd Morning Show. Like you joked earlier, you were you were the official psychic. And for folks listening to this uh, who aren't familiar with Scott and Todd, they were on, on radio in New York for decades and decades. Scott was a Hall, rock and roll of famer. Todd was a big radio star, and you were just a regular. Uh, you're a recurring character, as they say. You yeah. would come on at least once every six months or so. And more, I remember to this day, yeah. Th yeah, yeah. I remember to this day that people would, we would promote that you were coming on the show on Wednesday and they would call on Tuesday and be like, hey, can I stay on hold <laughs> for the next day to speak to John Edward? What do you think that's about? Like, I mean, obviously what you do is an incredible gift and we're going to get into what it actually is in a moment. But like this idea of the number of people that want to speak with you, what do you think that is? And I know you always, you, you try to be humble about it, that you're like this vessel, but w tell me about this, this connection with the audience and community that you've built over the last few decades. I think what's important is the approach. So my dad was a New York City police officer and a career military guy who hated the subject matter, didn't want my mom to even be a part of it, wouldn't want, you know, when my grandmothers would have psychics come to the house and my mom was very into the subject matter. My dad was not. So I think because I knew he was so in opposition of this work, when I got involved with it, I always felt like I had him, like the two old guys in the Muppets, like, you know, in the balcony, yeah. like ready to pounce on every word. You know, that was the person that I always felt in the back of my mind. I was like, could he poke holes through this reading? So I would deliver information that hopefully people would going to connect with. And I think that radio is such an intimate medium 
for a medium that, you know, people would say to me all the time, like, you made me late for work because I couldn't get out of the car. Like I had to hear the reading. Um, I still have people to this day, you know, and I, I've done radio in almost, almost in every state. I was like that guy for a radio station because people <laughs> would talk, you know, and they would be like, Oh, you do Scott and Todd. Oh, you need to, you need to come on. I'm like, well, don't you want to talk to me first? Nope. If you're good enough, Scott and Todd, you can come on. <laughs> you know, then I did, you know, kid Craddock and kid, I, that was another show. So it's like all these different radio shows and the intimacy of radio. Um, I prefer to this day to television because it was live. You couldn't be accused of editing. Um, it was just really personal. So I think people felt and heard and experienced the raw, natural integrity of two people communicating, me and the person that I was talking to on the other end. You know, they inherently got that these were people in their houses calling to a radio station that I was sitting in and they became part of the show. It was very intimate and it was very real. And people still to this day will quote like, I'll have somebody say, oh my God, your favorite WPLJ radio um, reading you ever did was the lady who was dancing with her husband in the basement who had a diner booth. And, so this, and a dance floor. Didn't they, have, didn't they have a dance floor in the basement? Yeah. And a new box. They'll still bring that person up. I'm that's like, so funny. 25 years worth of radio. That's the reading that everybody comes up with, right? Wow. So, it's, that's so cool. Um, and, and also during this this journey where you, you're building up a reputation of being the star, your go-to radio, you get a TV show out of it, which to this day, I think looking back at it, you're probably like, how the F did someone give me a TV show? Like, And it ran for several seasons. What was the experience of being like a star of your own show? Um, a little surreal. And I didn't really see it as that. I saw it as this like ridiculous, awesome weight, um, this responsibility of representing the work, like representing the subject matter. Like, like somebody said, here, here's a flame. Don't let it go out. Like that to me was like, oh, okay, okay. And meanwhile, you know, you have producers and editors and network people constantly blowing on the flame, trying to like <laughs> blow it out and trying to stop that from happening. Um, the way the show came about is I, I had a book that was coming out and I said to the <laughs> stupid me, um, they said, you know, you have to promote this. I go, I'm good. I said, I've got a ton of radio connections. We're ready for that. And the, the publicist for the book company said, no. And I said, no. And she said, no, radio is not going to sell books. Television sells books. You're going to have to do the talk show circuit. And I said, yeah, I don't do TV. I do radio. <laughs> and she goes, oh, no, you don't do TV. She goes, well, if you don't do TV, she goes, we don't do your book. Like it was wow. that like in my face. And I was like, uh, okay, now I'm contracted to do this. Like this is part of my obligation. So I'm just, I was just me. I literally talked to my radio producing friends and said, do you know people on the television side? And people did. So then I would talk to, I, I would call the producers and talk to the producers and say, are you open to having a conversation about the subject matter? And I wound up booking myself on daytime talk shows wow. through that kind of connection because I wanted to make sure that they weren't going to blow out the flame, that they weren't going to put me in a circumstance that was going to be negative because I already had a career where I helped a lot of people and I didn't want anybody to see me in a bad light because it may take away from their experience. So I was very, very guarded about where I would go and what I would do. And I said, I said, I said no to a lot of stuff that people would be like, you did what now? And I'm like, no, it didn't feel right. So two of the producers that I worked with on, on like, you know, the Lisa show and some other shows said, we want to do, a, we want you to do your own show. I was like, oh my God, yes. I want to do a late night radio national call-in show. Can you do that? And they were like, no, we meant TV. I was like, TV? I was like, yeah, no. I was like, I don't want to do TV. I want to do radio. I like radio. I was a radio guy. That was my, my training. Yeah. And they said, no, we want to do TV. If we can't get you sold into television, We'll, we'll pursue radio. And I said, national radio? And they went, yeah. I said, because I could do local. Like, I want to do national. And they go, yeah, national, absolutely. I think I went to just a few meetings. And then the next thing I know, I was in like a pilot for Crossing Over, filmed on the Maury Povich set. And I remember standing there going like, what is absolutely <laughs> happening right now? Like, I never thought that was going to happen. Like, I really honestly, um, it's not something I wanted. It's not something that I manifested. It's not something I was looking for. Radio I wanted. This I did not. So it was kind of like a, I went where the universe guided me. And, I, and when people say, why you? I think it's because 
it was the 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 ability with how I utilized it to teach. Mm-hmm. And I didn't make it about me, I made it about the subject matter, which is kind of my still focus. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, now let's get into your gift. Um, so we've talked about, you know, we, we, we've made it clear during this conversation over the last 20 minutes that you are a psychic medium. Right. But what does that mean? Like what do you describe what you see, how you feel, and for, for folks who are initiated with the way you work, how do these sessions go? So let's start ex- exactly how this gift permeates through your soul. Right. So I like to not use the word gift. I like to use the word ability. So okay. what happens is the way we have senses, we have psychic senses. And I'm basically just tapping into my psychic senses and paying attention to what it is. Like we all have muscle. And when people go to the gym and work out, they're going to develop their genetic ability to increase their muscle. But now if they really work out, if they eat correctly and they take supplements and they're hitting the gym hard, they're going to get in their best shape possible. So I'm kind of like I equate fitness and, and this in the same way. I worked at it. Like I worked at being the best I possibly can. So I sit with a client. And let me differentiate the difference between a psychic and a medium. A psychic is somebody who uses their ability, reads the energy of their client, and talks about what's happening in the now, now, what's happening in the past, and then what's coming up for them, like past, present, and future, and gets into maybe some of the lessons of what they're kind of maybe working with, obstacles or blockages. A medium is somebody who uses that same psychic ability of maybe seeing, hearing, and feeling energy. But now it's going to be utilized for people in, in the spirit world, the afterlife, to kind of connect through. So um, every medium has to be a psychic first, but not every psychic is a medium. There is a there's definitely a difference. Although if you're on TikTok or social media, everybody calls themselves psychic mediums. There's no differentiation, and people need to be very, 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 very careful um, and never never surrender your skepticism just because somebody has the word psychic and medium in front of their title. Because anybody could like pop up an account and call them that. So be very, very careful with all fields in metaphysics because there's not a lot of safety guards that are out there. So you have to be very discerning um, and look for information, not somebody putting on a performance, not somebody who's a great personality, not somebody who, like just be really, really careful. Look for validation and information of what they're saying. Okay. So and and so what do you see during these sessions? Like when you because like you said, you're you're speaking, like you said, you talk to the dead. Um, what exactly are you seeing? What are you experiencing during these sessions when, when you're speaking to someone? So it depends upon what the person wants me to see. So if somebody's you know relative is giving me information, they'll give me maybe a scene from their life, a moment to validate something that just happened like that day where they're sitting. Um, it really depends. But all of it is to validate that there's a survival of consciousness, a survival of love, that our loved ones and friends are still with us, that they want us to know that they're still with us. Um, and to help validate that, they've got to give us information. And uh, let's pull on that skepticism th- th- thread because you brought it up. Uh, if someone's watching this on YouTube, there's probably on the sidebar, there's like 500 videos debunking psychics. Sure. Uh, people like the amazing Randy have made a career out of debunking a- any sure. kind of spirituality or science. What do you say to those folks? And I know, and trust me, I know the answer to this because the guy from Long Island has never left you. Uh, yeah. You know, like go F them. But like, what do you say to someone? Because maybe your fans will be like, oh, I went to see John Edward. So I'll be like, oh, well, what are you wasting your money going seeing that guy? So what, what do you say to the skeptics out there? I have a couple of answers, right? So one, for the people who don't know me from like, you know, radio days and they don't know me from Crossing Over or the second show that I did um, or any of the appearances that I did on like every show that was out there. Um, they may know me from being the biggest douche in the universe on South Park, right? I have my an entire episode dedicated to me, you know, for that. So they learn about me that way and they go to YouTube and they learn more about me and an awareness gets raised. So I'm always about raising awareness. I've always been about raising awareness and I want people to learn about the subject matter so that they don't have to go to a psychic. So they don't have to go get a reading that they just have an understanding that life and love are eternal. But when it comes to the skeptics, we have to differentiate the difference between a skeptic, and a cynic. And a cynic is somebody who's made up their mind that nothing's possible. Zero. A skeptic is going, I'm not sure. I'm agnostic about it until I have further proof data and I can analyze the reality of it. So to me, I want everybody to be skeptical, specifically in 2024. Like I said, you cannot go on social media. I did a test about two weeks ago on TikTok, only TikTok. In a 10-day period while I was on the road, 84 live stream psychic mediums doing readings on TikTok. 84. 84. None of them I would watch. 
all of them, I was like, you've got to be kidding. Now, I I messed up my algorithm by actually doing that test because then they just kept coming and I had to go block, right, yeah. block, block, block. But I think it's really important for people to be skeptical. So I'm the person who's going to be like, listen, be objective, be skeptical, but also listen to the real people who do this because I'm not the only person. There are many people who can do this legitimately. And they're going to give information, not emotion. They're going to give facts and evidence that back up and support that there's a survival of consciousness. So there are people who are going to call themselves skeptics, but they're really cynics. And they're going to you know, say, oh my God, this guy was debunked. He was proven to be a fraud. He was this, he was that. Because anybody can say whatever they want to say. But the reality is, I'm one of the people who went to the University of Arizona and was tested four times. Three official, double blind studies. And there's a book written about it called The Afterlife Experiments, written by Dr. Gary Schwartz. Now, to me, that was important to do. If somebody was saying, I want to like, test this and do double blind studies with EEG and EKGs and all of that stuff, it was daunting, but I'm happy that I did it. Right. So I say to people, when they go, Where's the science? I go, Go read that book. The studies are in there. So healthy skeptic is, I think, important. I think in, if you're a critical thinker in every field, I mean, we are living in my lifetime, probably the most divisive period of time I think I've ever seen, where everybody is a journalist, an epidemiologist, <laughs> an analyst, a stockbroker, a, a crypto guy, like, you know, a vaccine specialist, a political analyst, and a psychic. It's like everybody's got their ability to turn their phone on and become whatever it is that they want to be with not a lot of backing that up. So I think being skeptical is good. Awesome. Uh, one of the things you do, big part of it is, man, you're, you're like the Rolling Stones. You travel all over the world. You do these live shows. I got yeah. to experience one of them in Charleston last year. And it's really cool because people be like, wait, how do you see a psychic at a show? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? How does he talk to everybody in the audience? But tell, tell folks, what do you hope to gain from those shows? Because I know people, when people go, they hope to gain hopefully a reading from you. Right. But what is it that you like to impart when you go on the road playing all over the planet? But what, what do you feel is, is like your number one mission as, when you walk out of that theater? I want to leave people better than I find them. I want to answer their questions about the concept of energy and the survival of consciousness. I want people to know that their loved ones and friends who are not physically here with them are still energetically present. And that they're a part of what's happening now. So when you go, does my mom see this? Yeah, she does. Does my son see this? Yeah, he does. And here's the evidence to back that up. So when people come to an event, they're coming to a classroom. So I always tell people like, it's, you may find it entertaining, but I'm not an entertainer. I'm not a performer. I'm, I'm an educator. My job is to teach. That's what my goal is. That's what my intent is. Hmm. And one of the shows that I saw last year, you brought this up, and I'm not sure if you could talk more about it, but you, for years, you undercover under the, 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 the darkness of night, you were helping law enforcement on cases. Yes. And one of these law enforcement officers is, was, was in the middle when, when you, you brought up of writing a book about his relationship to you yes. while solving crimes. Yes. Uh, can you just share that story with, with, uh, with, with the folks listening right now? And what's what how is that looking and you know is that book going to come, be coming out soon 2025 i just got off of a publishing call where we're talking about it um the the title of the book is called chasing evil um i can't really say much more than that but yeah the title of the book is called chasing evil um and the entire story is in there this gentleman came to me ironically joe because he used to listen to me on plj of course he was angry that you guys had me on the show so he decided that he was going to take it upon himself to expose me as a fraud and have me arrested and that's how that came about so he wound up coming to me um and long story short i wound up working with him i wound up reading for him the day that he came for me with the case and it kind of it set up a really interesting dynamic because he became like, we're like the same age. He's, I think I'm either a little older than him. He's a little older than me. I'm not really sure. But um, he, uh, he became like a surrogate father figure because he, he was my dad. My dad was the police officer, career military guy. 
And here is an ex police officer, now FBI guy, who's like got that energy. And I got a chance, to, I think, to work through some of my daddy issues. Wow. With working with him. I know it was like, it was very, it was very therapeutic. Like, you know, I, I, I didn't want to open the door to my dad because we were estranged. So this was a way of working through that. So, like, I tell people, like, I practice what I preach. Like, you got to work on your obstacles and your blockages. And this is a way. And I, and I said to him once, I go, can I just ask a favor? And he's like, sure. I go, can you just not use my name anywhere? And he laughed and he goes, use your name. He goes, dude, I don't want to get effing and fired. He's like, I'm not using it <laughs> anywhere. He was like, nobody's going to know about this. And then here we are 25 years later, he retired from it. And he was like, I kind of feel like I need to tell this story. And I got that because the way that I needed to kind of engage with him on that, like that kind of way, um, there's this one very, the case that he came to me on, it's that, it's that big case, that big story, that that big albatross. And I think this book is a way of him releasing that. So it's therapeutic for him. So it's been a, it's been a, an amazing, amazing journey, but I, I was never public about it. I kept it really quiet because I was concerned about my own safety, to be honest. I'm a little, still, I'm actually, honestly, I'm a little apprehensive still for certain things of my own safety. Wow. Speaking of safety is it, it I mean, is it an issue? I mean, because the fact that you're so, you you know you're not you're not holed up in, in some sort of fortress on Long Island. You like I mentioned, you travel a lot. Is that something that is that? I mean, again, we're New Yorkers, so we're always thinking that someone's out to get us. But you, you doubly so because of what you do. Is that something you fear for? Maybe and obviously you have a you have family and kids, so maybe that even double doubles down on that. But how do you feel in terms of your own safety? I don't give it. I'm not too worried now. I mean, I had some issues when I was on television. You know, people say, do you miss TV? I'm like, no, <laughs> like, no, um, it's kind of like, like, I remember I was with the producer of crossing over the woman who actually sold the show and we were at universal and Harry Potter had just opened up the Harry Potter land, whatever it is. Yeah. And we were standing there. So here's the psychic guy in like the wonderful wizard of the world, the Harry Potter. So people would be into like the subject matter and nobody cared. And she like looked at me and she smiled and I, and I was like, what? And she goes, you're loving this right now. Like nobody's bothering you. And I went, nope. And I was like, Adora, nobody cares. And she literally laughed and went, that, that part should bother you a little bit. Just so you know, She's like, just let you know, she goes, it should bother you just a little bit. And I was like, I understand what you're saying. I go, but to be able to walk somewhere at my family again, to be able to be there and people not, you know, it just, I don't miss that part. So like, I was very excited to have the opportunity to do, to do it. I'll, I, I kind of wish I, I wish the me of today can go back to, to the me of then and say, I know all your trepidations and fears and you're trying to make sure that the flame doesn't go out, but try to have fun while you're doing this. Cause I didn't, I can't say I enjoyed it. I can't say that I took the opportunity to go, wow, this is cool. Like, this is fun. To me, it was like really stressful. Like it was a very, like, you know me. So yeah. like. I, I I think in the what twenty three years of twenty five years of doing the station with you guys, I I personally asked to meet one person the entire time that came into the show, just one person, and that was Barbara Eden. That was the only person I wanted to meet. <laughs> All the celebrities. I, I dream of Jeannie for everyone under forty. Uh, yeah, like Barbara Eden was the only person. Like I just loved Barbara Eden as a kid. You know. Um, and, you know, Sandra needed to re meet Rick Springfield. And, you know, there's a funny story. Of course, we went on the cruise. We had that little rock and roll cruise. Yeah, yep. I mean, do you think about, I mean, I guess now you have more self-awareness than you did as a, as a young person. We all do, hopefully. Yep. Um, but just sort of the domino effect or a six degrees separation, whatever metaphor analogy you want to use of like how these little things all led to where you are today and the fact sure. that you were able to carve out an, a remarkable career like I said, in a, in a time where you couldn't just be a self-made person, like you needed someone to call you and be like, you know, it's like if, if you're a major league player, you get called up to the majors, you're a star kid. You, you made it on your own. Obviously you had people around you that supported you, helped you, but like all these chains of events that led to this, do you look back and like, if you just take one domino out, if it, it screws it up, I mean, it, it, yeah. do you reflect on that? All the time. And that's where gratitude comes in. I have a lot of gratitude for the opportunities 
and I never take that for advantage. So even though I might not have enjoyed the television part on one level, the gratitude for the reach and getting a message out there has not, I, that's, that's always been there. Hmm. Always. John, if folks want to get in touch with you now, keep up with everything that's going on. There's books that you, I know you have a huge online community. W where should they start if they want to get introduced to John Edward? So there's two places that they can go. The first place is always my website, which is John Edward, no S on Edward, John Edward.net. But um, I launched, so I left television in 2008 and I launched an online community. And I won't bore you with all the details because most of it didn't work. But in the last 18 months, it's working. Um, and it's called EvolvePlus.tv. And I have, my, I have my own channel on this platform. So there's, there's a lot of stuff on here. But on my channel specifically, um, I go live, I actually do readings for people, I answer the questions. There's a, uh, a whole series on how to develop your abilities, which would normally be like a $1,200 in-person workshop. That's on there. Um, a lot of my books are on there. So it's like one-stop shopping for all things that are connected to the subject matter. And that's at EvolvePlus.tv. But then there's a channel called The Orbit where there's astrologers and numerologers, numerologists, um, tarot folks that are on there. There's a channel called, um, there's a channel for mindfulness called, um, I'm going to lose my, my thinking, mind, Mindless to Mindful with um, a brilliant teacher named Melanie Whitney. Um, there's a channel for grief called The Journey. There's a What's Cooking group that's there. We have a fitness group that's now starting, a fitness channel. So it's a very robust life evolving application and platform. And people can set up their own profile like it was Instagram or Twitter. But it's no politics, not religious, not divisive. It's like a really cool sanctuary. And people can go live there. So it gives me, it gives me this kind of radio station vibe back feeling again. That's so cool. Uh I want to just end on this. Did you ever crunch the numbers and be like, uh, would I have made this much money in healthcare if I if I no. stuck to health? <laughs> no, because you know, I've made money, I've lost money, I've made money. And like when I left TV, I think the funniest, you know, moment was when I said they wanted me to do another three seasons of uh of the show that I was doing. And I said, I can't, I need to teach, and you guys aren't gonna let me teach. I'm gonna go on online and teach because I saw this whole platform, like what I'm doing now, like yeah. I saw it clear as a bell. It didn't exist. Well, it didn't exist for a reason because the people in the zeitgeist wasn't there yet. So I created it. Like I literally hired all the programmers to create what my vision was. Um, and it didn't work. And like it almost bankrupt me, to be honest. Wow. So yeah, it was a it was a it was a huge like and Sandra was great even through that. She just said to me, So are we done doing this now? Like it was like, <laughs> are, are are we done doing this? Like um, it was a, it was a, it was a very overwhelming financial albatross and I couldn't understand why it didn't work. Well, the timing wasn't right. We were, people weren't there yet. You know, this was 2009. Oof. Yeah, exactly. They were, they, they, somebody said to me, I, I went to a, cause I had to, I went to a venture capitalist person and I was like, is this something you guys would invest in? And he goes, you're too early. He goes, the only thing people are doing like this online subscription is porn. He goes, and I don't think that's your audience. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, you are a handsome man, John. Uh, well, I appreciate the time, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joe. And that's today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note and tell me your story, you can email me, Joe Partavilla at ProtonMail.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, it would be awesome if you could hit that big old thumbs up button. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, leaving a five-star review would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.